Ah, okay. I, I think we are live now. Yeah? Great. I think we should start, yeah? Because it's already two, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay. Is everything okay, Vinny? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, uh, devolvendo para vocês. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now Rosalind is host again, and I will start. Is it, is it okay? No, I'm not a host because I cannot share the screen at the moment. Just one second. He's passing on to you. Estão devolvendo. Uhum. Agora o Ruslan é host, tá certo? So you are host again, ok, Ruslan? Oh, thank you. Yes, I'm, um, yes. Nice. Great. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the first of a series of lives offered by Abrapt, Brazilian Association of Researchers in Translation. Uh, you are very welcome to this live and questions may be, may be sent anytime through chat on YouTube. Yeah, so feel free to ask questions and Professor Mitkov will answer as many as he can after the lecture. Please remember to subscribe using the link that will be shared with you right now. And then you will receive a certificate of attendance. Uh, and you can also use the chat for doubts and we'll be glad to help you with anything you need. On behalf of Abrapt, I am very honored to have Professor Mitkov open this series of lectures and uh, the abbreviated bio below will speak for itself. Professor uh, Dr. Rosalind Mitkov has been working in natural language processing, computational linguistics, corpus linguistics, machine translation, translation technology, and related areas since the early 1980s. Whereas Professor Mitkov is best known for his seminal contributions to the areas of anaphora resolution and automatic generation of multiple choice tests, his extensively cited research, more than 250 publications, including 15 books, 35 journal articles, and 36 book chapter, chapters, also covers topics such as machine translation, translation memory, and translation technology in general. Bilingual term extraction, automatic identification of cognates and false friends, natural language generation, automatic summarization, computer-aided language processing, centering and evaluation, corpus annotation, NLP-driven corpus-based study of translation universals, text simplification, NLP for people with language disabilities and computational phraseology. Mitkov is author of the monograph, An Afro Resolution, published by Longman. Uh, an editor of the most successful Oxford University Press handbook, the Oxford Handbook of Computational Linguistics. Current prestigious projects include his role as executive editor of the Journal of Natural Language Engineering, published by Cambridge University Press, and editor-in-chief of the Natural Language Processing book series of John Benjamin's publishers. Dr. Mitkov is also working on the forthcoming Oxford Dictionary of Computational Linguistics by uh, Oxford University Press, co-authored with Patrick Hanks, and the forthcoming second substantially revised edition of the Oxford Handbook of Computational Linguistics. Professor Mitkov is the coordinator of the first international Erasmus Mundus Master Program on Technology for Translation and Interpreting, of which, on behalf of Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, I am an official uh, associated partner. 
He has been invited as a keynote speaker at a number of international conferences, including conferences on translation and translation technology. He has acted as program chair of various international conferences on natural language processing, machine translation, translation technology, translation studies, corpus linguistics, and an offer of resolution. Dr. Mitkov is asked on a regular basis to review our leading international funding bodies and organizations and to act as a referee for applications for professorships, both in North America and Europe. Ruslan Mitkov is regularly asked to review for leading journals, publishers, and conferences, and serve as a member of program committees or editor editorial boards. Professor Mitkov has been an external examiner of many doctoral theses and curricula in the UK and abroad, including master's programs related to NLP, translation, and translation technology. He has considerable external funding to his credit and is cu currently acting as principal investigator of several large uh, projects, some of which are funded by UK research councils, by the EC, as well as by companies and users from the UK and the United States. Mitkov is professor, now, a professor of computational linguistics and language engineering at the University of Wolverhampton, which he joined in 1995 and where he set up the research group in compu computational linguistics. Professor Mitkov is also director of the Research Institute in Information and Language Processing. He is vice president of an, uh, ESLING, an international association for promoting language technology. He also serves as vice chair for the prestigious EC funding program, Future and Emerging Technologies. In recognitions of his outstanding professional and research achievements. Professor Mitkov was awarded the title of Dr. Honoris Causa at Plovdiv University. In two, I'm sorry for the pronunciation of the name of the university, but then you can correct me. And, uh, in uh, 2011 and in 2014, he was conferred on Professor Honoris Causa at Veliko Tarnovo University. Wow, <laughs> but now this is myself. Above all, Ruslan is a great friend and I was so lucky to meet him a couple of years ago. And since then, he has always been so kind and generous and patient. And regardless of his countless responsibilities, he did not hesitate when I invited him to give this presentation. So I really don't know if I deserve such a consideration, but Ruslan has never said no to my request <laughs> for him. So I have no words to thank you, Ruslan, for sharing a little of your knowledge with us today. And now the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I wish I was as kind as Hosani Hebeki, the president of the Brazilian Association of researchers in translation who is organizing this series. Thank you very much for inviting me. So the pleasure is above all mine. So I would like to thank you. And this is what I'm going to say on my first slide. Now I'm going to share my screen uh, and then I'm going to start my presentation. Um, I just need a second to go to the presentation. And I share the screen and this presentation is named, actually the title is God, Don't Get the Translators Wrong, Deliver the Best Translators, Interpreters and Tools Instead. Well, this presentation was supposed to start with music. There's a wonderful song by the pretenders, Don't Get, the, Don't Get Me Wrong. And this was going to be the theme of uh, the, 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 the lecture, but unfortunately, we couldn't figure out how we can get Zoom to output the music yesterday. We had a, a little test, but it didn't work. So it will be without music, it doesn't matter. Another thing is that I uh, just wanted to mention, uh, this is, there is a delay about 30 seconds between my presentation and the YouTube broadcasting. So I won't be able to do live interactive activities I was, as I was planning initially to do, but it doesn't matter. 
today I managed to um, somehow revise the lecture so that there are no interactive activities included. So first of all, I'll, on this slide, you see this slide. I'd like to thank Dr. Huzan Hebeki from, um, from the University of Rio, so, uh, Rio Grande do Sul from Porto Alegre, who is also the president of the Brazilian Association for Transla Research and Translation. I would like to ask uh, to, invite, uh, to thank her very much for inviting me to open the abrupt lecture series. And I'm delighted to give this presentation to the Brazilian Association of Researchers in Translation, all Brazilian students, and to students from all over the world who have joined uh, this presentation. I'd like to thank you all. And I would like to start by saying that I very much hope that Brazil gets over the very difficult situation of coronavirus and not only Brazil, but all, all over the world, we can have a life as we used to have in the past. So I, I would like to dedicate this presentation to all, to all of us to be healthy and happy in the future and none of us to catch a coronavirus. So the preliminaries is that this invited lecture will be very easy to follow. In fact, it's outrageously non-technical. So those of you who would have preferred a more technical one, I would like to apologize. And the premise is that no one from the audience knows anything about natural language processing, machine translation, or translation memory. So this is my premise. So this is why I'm so outrageously um, uh, simple. Husani, can I ask you a question? Do you see the presentation well? Yes, very well. Mm -hmm. Can Please. you hear me well? Yes, very well. That's right. Do you see a little window with my face or you don't? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, I fantastic. Do. Everything is under control. Yes. So what Thanks. is natural language processing? This is something that I'm going to mention many times today. So I'm going to start with a very brief definition. It's about interdisciplinary field concerned with the processing of human languages by computers. So there are some alternative terms. The more you go, go further down, the more applied it becomes. But I'm not going to delve into more details. So natural language processing is processing language, natural language by computers. And what is natural language? Well, we have natural languages like Greek, English, German, Portuguese, Spanish, Russian, Ukrainian, Serbian, Latin, but also Asian, Greek, and Sumerian languages which have disappeared. Those are still natural. And we have artificial languages like all programming languages, like uh, the musical scale, the musical language, Morse codes, Esperanto, all those have been coined artificially on purpose by humans, and this, this is why they are artificial, whereas the natural ones have developed spontaneously in the history of mankind. I work on many topics. I'm not going to actually talk about them. Uh, my host mentioned some of them. Um, recently, I started working on digital humanities. I am also started working on natural language processing for interpreters and for natural language processing for social media, we identify hate speech among other things. So let's have a look at snapshots in time. Today, we're going to talk about uh, translation technology mainly, not about any other topic that I pursue. Let's take a snapshot in time and go back in the history. So I'm going to ask you a question. In fact, I'm going to answer this question. Where was the first computer developed? So. The first computer was developed consecutively in a sequence of events in Germany between 41 and 43, in the United Kingdom 44, and the United States 46. So I'm going to avoid historical and political debates and arguments who was the first. We can assume that every next version was slightly better than the first one, but let's assume for the sake of political correctness to say that the first computer was uh, developed in Germany, United Kingdom, and United States. But remember the year, it was between 43 and 46. Remember this year very well, 1943, 1946. Why? Because, and this is how the first computers looked like. They were very big, they were a huge premise, and they were very slow. They only would operate in air conditioning. So this was the time when nobody from those who attended lectures that today were born. So it was a long time ago. So the beginning of machine translation was only one year 
After that, Weaver, who was an American uh, statistician, had this very simple idea. Let's take the source language, let's encode it, and then we shall decode it into a target language. And this is called machine translation. This was a very simple, and by the way, a very silly idea. Why? Well, because, I mean, he underestimated many things. So his idea that you have a language A, then encode, decode again, then language B, and then you get a translation. So initially the, the first output of machine translation was very poor to such an extent that there were all kinds of jokes. There was a joke saying that there was a Rus there was um, English to Russian machine translation program who would translate the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak. This is a Shakespeare quote into, into, into Russian and then back from Russian into English. And then the back translation into English was different. It was the vodka is strong, but the meat is rotten. This was a joke, it never happened, but many textbooks in machine translation keep on giving this example. Well, the, jokes means, the joke means that the quality was pretty poor at that time. And he failed, and he would have failed even if he had the supercomputers of today. His view was very simplistic and language is irregular and ambiguous. And don't forget that the ambiguity, ambiguity of language is one of the biggest problems that computers have when trying to process natural language. So this is a message that I would like to, you to remember. I often show this slide in my presentation. So language is irregular, it has many um, exceptions and is also ambiguous. Talking about ambiguity, I know that most of you speak Portuguese, but I'm sure that you'll understand this example in Spanish. So the Pope goes to Cuba and the Cuban guy asks his friend, how is Pope in English? And then his friend says potato. And then we have the slogan, welcome potato. Why? Because in Cuban Spanish, Papa means both potato and Pope. And so the friend took the wrong meaning. So this is why you have this uh, welcoming slogan, welcome potato. So this is lexical ambiguity where one word could mean more than one thing. Semantic ambiguity is where you have one word which has two different semantic roles. In, on this cartoon, the rabbit is ready for lunch the rabbit has the semantic role of agent, so the rabbit is ready to eat something, but on this cartoon, the rabbit has the semantic role of patient, so somebody is going to eat the rabbit. This is why this sentence, the rabbit is ready for lunch, is ambiguous. And if you look at this example, we, only serve, we serve only men here. This is also ambiguous, why? Because men can have two semantic roles. So either men are the recipients, they're given drinks or food, or the men are on the menu. So this is why this is ambiguous. Do you still hear me well? Yes, perfect. Thank you very much. So as a result of the first very poor uh, performance of machine translation systems, in the United States came out the so-called OPAC report, which said, there is no immediate or predictable prospect of machine translation, which is useful. As a result, the United States and many countries in the world stopped the funding. And for about 20 years, there was no research on machine translation. The only three projects underway was one in Macau, one in Hong Kong, and one in, in uh, Grenoble in France. Until 85, when the Japanese invested a lot of money in their project for fifth generation computer, they had a huge research group in Kyoto, where they developed a lot of promising machine translation programs and only in 85, 500,000 pages were translated by computer. So 70 years on, machine translation has taken off. Machine translation is getting better and better. Uh, it works very well in some scenarios and it also works well in, for gisting purposes, not always, of course, but it provides billions of translation a day 
for 200 million users, it surpasses what professional translators handle in a full year. And machine translation has really taken off because statistical machine, machine translation was the hit of the last 20 years, apart from the last three, four years, where neural machine translation based on deep learning is the buzzword and neural machine translation is doing really very well. So Google Trans uh, Translate has outperformed Sistran and Prompt due to the availability of huge bilingual data and very often machine translation works in combination with translation memory, which makes it also useful for professional translators. Uh, deep learning is now incorporated in almost every system and the results are even better. It is even used by professional translators. Even six years ago, I'm chair of one of the um, leading conferences in the field of translation technology. It's called Translating the Computer, takes place in London every November. And um, I met six or seven years ago, translators from Saudi Arabia, who told me that even that time, they were paid by their government to run machine translation on, the, on several British and American newspapers, and they would post edit the output. And by doing so, they would get more translations done. So even back in 2012, 13, they used to use machine translation uh, as professional translators. So now it's used in the EC and many other organizations. So there has been some recent excitement about um, deep learning for machine translation neural machine translation, you can see all kind of those claims. There's all those companies like Google, like uh, IBM, uh, Microsoft are claiming that their translator translation is as good as the human one, uh, as the Altrados, and some translators are even worried about their jobs. However, the reality is that uh, it is a hype, it is a myth. If you look at this graph, this is a very interesting research by Philip Cohen. 2017, and also a former student of mine who is Brazilian, by the way, Sheila Castillo. Uh, she works now in Dublin. Uh, she and her colleagues made, uh, conducted some experiments, evaluation experiments, and found out that neural machine translation is still way below the quality of human translations. So all of you who want to work as translators or are translators, please don't worry. Machines are far back behind humans. So as a result of the disappointment of insufficient quality in machine translation, and as a result of Weaver's dreams, which did not come true, um, we could say that automatic translation is still not good for professional translation. And it can be seen on many occasions, especially if you look at multi-word expressions. Multi-word expressions are like idioms, like collocation, those are sequences of words which don't have literal meanings and they machine translation system don't get them quite successfully translated. And there are many funny mistakes. So multi-word expression like it's raining cats and dogs, this is a, an idiom, it's a multi-word expression. Not every machine translation program will translate as well. Um, uh, this is another multi-word expression, fly off the handle in English. I don't know whether you know what it means in English. Fly off in the handle means to lose one's temper suddenly, and many machine translation programs will not translate this correctly either. So I made a few experiments. Uh, I'll show you a few slides. I took this idiom, kick the bucket, which means to die from, this is an example from the Longman Dictionary of Idioms. And this sentence was input into several machine translation programs from English into Spanish. Many of you speak Spanish. Prompt is a program developed in South Petersburg in Russia. You see that translation is pretty poor in Spanish. If you look at Sistran, pretty poor in Spanish as well. If you compare it with the English uh, source. If you look at Google Translate, a bit better, but still poor because the verb is not conjugated. Otherwise, estirar la pata is the correct multi-word expression in Spanish to die. Uh, so this was 2015. I repeated these experiments in 2018. Why? Because in 2018, we had already new neural machine translation and all those programs would use machine neural machine translation. If you look at the results, they're pretty similar, pretty bad, pretty equally bad. 
So deep learning did not help much on this occasion. And we have here DeepL, which is one of the latest machine translation programs, which people speak very high about it, of it, but still very poor. I want to ask a question. Do you speak very fast or is it okay? Do you speak fast? No, it's okay. Okay. Okay, so the multi-word expressions are pain in the neck for computers, and this is a fact. And the detection and translation of multi-word expressions is important for translators, for interpreters, for natural language processing programs. And um, I mean, translators and computers don't always have a very good relationship, by the way. And in 2015, I gave a keynote speech at the conference of the Association for Translation, Translators and Interpreters of Spain and Portugal. And the title of the presentation was Computers and Translators, a Love-Hate Relationship. And uh, obviously, at that time, I would explain how, how nervousome translators are that they would lose their jobs. And I would give an example from, um, give an example from, um, from a question I had when I was giving a talk in Buenos Aires in 2015, a gentleman came and said, oh, the technological process is fine, it happens everywhere, but we're losing our jobs. So I was planning to have an interactive activity with you to ask you a question, whether this is true, but uh, obviously we cannot have this interactive activity because as I explained at the beginning of my presentation, there is about 30, 40 seconds delay between my presentation and uh, its output on YouTube. So I'm just going to say that it is not correct to say that computers are taking away the jobs of interpreters and translators. What is happening is that they may change their job profile. Um, they may work as post editors, post editing programs of machine translation, or they can use translation memory system and all professional translators who actually translate technical uh, information and medical information, they use uh, uh, translation memory systems. It is also true that the information is growing exponentially and translators will be always very much in need. And I wanted just to show you a few slides and to offer you an interactive activity to say, this is a, um, a statement by Sigmund Freud I just wanted to to have a go or have a joke about the love hated relationship between computers and translators. This is especially true to the translators for the translators who are not in their um, in, who are not teenagers, but for all of you who are attending this talk who are teenagers or slightly um, more than teenagers, I'm sure that you wouldn't have any problems with the computers so there was a problem in the 50s and the 60s because at that time, at that time, the machine translation was pretty poor. So at that time, professional translators had to do something. There was Krollman, who was a translator in the European community, who proposed the idea to, re to reuse the existing human translations. And this is something which already reminds you or sounds like translation memory, doesn't it? So Athen, Cromwell was a German translator, Athen was a British one. Uh, Athen went further in 79. He proposed not only the reuse of the exact same translation, but also the retrieval of identical text fragments, so, but also similar ones. So he was saying, let's not show to the translator the exact sentences they have translated. Let's show them something similar they have translated, and they can maybe simply change it a bit, and by doing so, they can save time. And this was actually um, the basis for a uh, translation memory system. After 10 years, company Star and then Trados, they, on the basis of those, ide those ideas, they implemented the first translation memory tool. And the translation memory system provoked, led to dramatic changes in the translation workflow. So what do the translators want? They want to have their productivity increased. They want to access and reuse ideas from previous translations. 
they, they don't want to translate the same sentence twice again. This is what they want. So this is something they want to do to save time. And this is um, an example of an interface from Kratos, for those of you who haven't seen it. So let's imagine you're translating this sentence to create an event object, please follow the action below. And let's imagine that in your database of previous translations, which you have been collecting, you have translated a similar sentence, but this time is to delete an event object, please follow the steps below. And then you have translated this sentence already into German, um ein ob event object solution, gehen Sie bitte wie folgt vor. So this sentence in German already exists. So what, what do you do? Instead of translating the, the above sentence from scratch, you use this one, and you simply change delete and steps into German. And so you click twice and the using, I mean, the, the translation memory system is telling you that there is a match 84% fuzzy match. So it takes you a second to translate a sentence. So this is the philosophy of translation memory system to save time for the user and also for the translator. So there are many for professional translators, the translation memory systems. They use a database of previously translated texts and they compare how much a current sentence matches a previously translated one. They use the so-called edit distance symmetric. Since most of you are not mathematicians, I'm not going to say that this metric edit distance was proposed by the Russian mathematician Levenstein and some people call it still Levenstein distance. So this is a, this, a metric which computes how many uh, iterations you need to um, undertake in order to change one string into another. It's a very simple one, but I'm not going to go into it. Uh, the translation memory systems ensure that no sentence need to be translated twice and ensure those systems ensure consistency. They're very useful for translation of repetitive text and voluminous text. You wouldn't use a translation memory system to translate only one sentence. You would use it if you have to translate a document or a long text. And it's typical for technical text, medical text, legal text, where there are some repetitions. Those are the most popular translation memory systems. Tradus has been on, on the market for many years. Uh, Tradus, now it's part of SDLX. And it's a very successful system. Wordfuzz is another success. In recent years, MemeQ has been the most used by translators. But nowadays, even MemSource, because MemSource is a web based translation memory system. It is, MemoQ is a Hungarian company, MemSource is a Czech company in Prague, and uh, Trados has been always a German company, but it was purchased by SDLX, which is a British one. So this is the business of translation. So the current translation memory systems, the commercial ones, have a lot of shortcomings. They can be easily fooled. And I'm going to give you the following example. Please read those three sentences. The wild child is destroying his new toy. The wild chief is destroying his new tool. And the wild children are destroying their new toy. So using the Levenstein distance or the edit distance, the translation memory systems, the commercial ones, will say that one, And two, a more similar one. Why? Because they have the same syntax. And in fact, one and three are more similar semantically. You can see this. The only difference is that we have a plural of children and we have plural of toys. But all commercial translation memory systems will say that one and two are more similar. So they'll give a wrong match. So this is something we wanted to change. I will, I'm not a translator myself. I have studied mathematics, my first degree, computer science, my second. I, I've been professor of linguistics and computational linguistics for many years. But I have worked for many years with translators and interpreters. So I was working with a translator from Buenos Aires who visited my research group back in 2005. And she pointed to me many, many uh, shortcomings of the commercial translation memory systems. 
And I thought, okay, let's do something. Let's use natural language processing to improve the commercial translation memory systems. Let's, let's make them more intelligent. So this is what I'm going to show you what we did. So this is simply a list of uh, projects that we have had as part of my research group. This is the website of the research group, which is not up, up to date, by the way. We did not do much updates during the coronavirus uh, lockdown. And um, we have embarked upon different projects, whether me with colleagues or me with master or PhD students. Uh, so our last, our latest project where we have involved PhD students and other students that we worked with is using deep learning to improve, to identify semantically equivalent matches in the translation memory system. And Tarindo, who is one of my PhD students in Wolverhampton, he is actually uh, the one who is playing the most active role in this project. And then in 2016, another PhD student of mine, together with colleagues, developed the so-called semantic textual similarity metric to be used in translation memory system. We wanted simply to be able to catch sentences which are semantically equivalent, not only syntactically close ones. So let me just, instead of going into, um, into technical details, I'll give you simply an example of a sentence. So if you could read this sentence, I like Rio de Janeiro, which is such an attractive and exciting place. Read this sentence, focus on it. And now please, and I would like to thank Payal, a student from India who is working with me. She is an excellent artist. She did those wonderful cartoons. Um, so you read this sentence, look, read now this sentence and which corresponds to a different cartoon. I love Rio de Janeiro as the city is full of attraction and excitement. So this is the second one, remember it. And now the third one, I dislike Rio de Janeiro, which is such an, an attractive and unexciting place. So which one, which are the ones more, more similar ones? Obviously one and two, of course, not one and three. However, when we experiment with the sentence, this is the, um, actually the, the edit distance. This is the metric which is used by the commercial translation memory systems. And this is our metric. This is actually a pretty low score, 72. Our sem semantic similarity uh, metric gives, it only works from one to four. It gives a higher score. And then if you look at those sentences, which are very different, the edit distance, which is the commercial translation memory systems metric gives 92 and ours only one. So you see, we can fool very easily the commercial translation memory systems by giving them sentences, which are very different and they think they're the same, but our actually semantic similarity metric is not full. So I think this is a very good uh, example of how natural language processing can make, uh, can could re revolutionize in fact the translation industry by making translation memory system more intelligent. So moving in the right direction, if you just to summarize, you look in the first um, actually row, those are two sentences which are very similar, but AD distance gives it 72 score hours, semantic similarity three, and those are very different, but AD distance is fooled, but our metric is not fooled. So this is moving in the right direction, and I'm very, very much encouraged by this uh, little example which shows that natural language processing has a lot of, um, has a lot of uh, future, holds promise for future translation technology applications. So now I would like to say that we haven't forgotten the interpreters. I know that many of those who are attending in the moment are interpreters. I know that some of my students are attending who are going, who are interpreters and they're going to join the MTTI program about which I'm going to speak in about five minutes. They are interpreters. So I'm going to, to show you, to share with you some ideas as to what we have done and what we can do, what we can do for interpreters, because the interpreters have been really forgotten. Uh, but with our new master program, we have actually have begun a new begun a new era where the interpreters have their tools as well. So they haven't forgotten. Indeed, they do need tools to help them. 
and there has been recent interest in the tools for interpreters. Uh, the conference in London that I mentioned had two sessions discussing tools for interpreters. And then the last conference, some of you attended it in Varna, and some of my students also attended the conference in London. They attended several talks which had to do with tools for interpreters. So we have to look at two different jobs. First of all, to assist the interpreters in their preparation for an interpreting jobs. Because I'm not an interpreter, but I have spoken to many interpreters, and I know that they prepare for an interpreting job. So it is important to offer them tools which will make this process faster. We have already developed methodology. I mean, there are many new terms which emerge, recently coined. You won't find their translation in dictionaries and not in parallel corpora. So one of my PhD students and me, we developed for the last two, three years, methodology which actually extracts translation of multi-word expressions and terms from comparable corpora. This is something that works, and we have already this methodology. This could help interpreters find easily um, uh, the translator, translation of terms which have only recently appeared. And my students who will be working on interpreting technology, they could simply implement this into a nice tool. Another thing that we could do, we haven't done it yet, but we would like to do it, to do the so-called automatic overview generation. Imagine you're an interpreter and you would like to prepare yourself for the interpreting job. So instead of reading for days and days different documents, we can develop a system which can actually harvest the web and generate an overview of the fields in a matter of minutes. So this is an example of a bioinformatics. So if the interpreter doesn't know anything about bioinformatics, so this could be done. And we could use our expertise in anaphora co-reference resolution and text summarization. We have been leading um, experts in these two fields. So we can use this to develop such an application. This is a challenging one, but this will be very useful for interpreters. Okay, this is preparation for the interpreting job, but then you have during the job. I have spoken to a lot of interpreters and they have told me that what would help would be text to speech flow on the screen. So it will be nice when you interpret to see the person speaking with the text on the screen. And they say also that those who interpret, they will, be, they will benefit from having the names, dates, numbers, and even multi-word expressions on the screen so that they, they don't have to look for them and even a support as to how they are translated into the target language. And I could en envisage such a very simple application which will use natural language processing tools. If you read this text, this text, which is a made up text, I simply made it up this morning. So, um, so imagine you're an interpreter so there are many names here. So the programs can use different natural language processing tools like name entity recognition to recognize names or temporal uh, processor to, to recognize numbers. And then imagine you interpret from English into Spanish. I'm sorry, I couldn't do it into Portuguese because I don't speak Portuguese. Even in fact, my Spanish had to be checked by one of my students, Laura. Uh, so what the system could do is actually identify automatically the names and propose the equivalent into Spanish and also the dates and the numbers into the corresponding correct format into Spanish and the countries is because not every Spanish, for instance, would know that Kazakhstan is translated into Spanish as Kazakhstan. So it's not Kazakhstan like in English. Uh, so yes, um, such a nice application could be done by my future master students or PhD students, and this could be something could be useful for interpreters. So I went even further and I, I have an idea, which is a bit of a dream to emulate translation memory for interpreters. We have already spoken about translation memory system for translators, but how can we do it for interpreters? Well, the idea I have is the following. It's not very easy. It's a very challenging one. It's a huge engineering effort and it has to be tested, but let me tell you what I think I could do. 
with your help, of course. You have here um, an English speaker. This slide comes with the sound, but I don't think you can hear the sound because we tried yesterday Zoom, it wouldn't output the sound. And then you have a Spanish speaker. They don't speak, the Spanish speaker doesn't speak Spanish. So the English speaker speaks in English. And then we have an interpreter who actually has the so-called interpreting memory. So how does it work? Just like translation memory. Imagine you interpret for a long time, months and years, and all your interpretation job is saved. It, first of all, it's, it's encoded into text, speech to text, and then saved as a file where actually you have the so-called interpretation memory. It's similar to the translation memory system. So each time um, the English speaker speaks, this gets converted into text. Then it's check checked against the database of interpretation. So this is the interpretation memory, in fact. So then what happens is that basically, if this is what the English speaker says, this goes into the interpretation database memory and then the interpretation memory finds that the sim this sentence has been already trans interpreted into Spanish. And basically this interpreter, the only thing she has to do to read it out, she can also consult um, information about what is common equity, it's a multi-word expression, if she doesn't know what it is. And basically, this is output into Spanish. So this is a very simple example which shows how possibly we could do something similar for interpreters. It's more difficult because we have speech to text transition, uh, but still it's not impossible. So now I'm proud to announce something which is very close to my heart, something which I designed with the help of my colleagues. It was my idea. And I'm very happy that this idea was funded by the European community. This is the first in the world Erasmus Mundus program technology for translation and interpreting. And some of the students who are attending this uh, presentation are exactly from this course. So um, it is the first and the only master program in the world in technology for translation and interpreting. It has the Erasmus Mundus branding, which is important. It has a very strong research emphasis. The students will be working with leading lights in translation technology and with leading lights in interpreting technology. And it has a very strong industrial emphasis. In fact, what the EC, the European community liked a lot about this program was the industrial emphasis. We have the top, top companies in the world who are associated partners and they participate in this program. And if you remember when I listed those translation memory systems, the vast majority, if not all, are our associated partners. So the, how does it work? Students study two year. They study year one at one of the three universities, the partner universities, and year two in the other. So the language of instruction is English, and each student undertakes one month placement at a company or a non-EC university, and at least one of the placement, if not both, will be at the company because we want to emphasize the industrial experience. So basically they study in year one, let's say in Malaga, year two in Wolverhampton, or year one in Sofia, year two in Malaga, or all, all those three combinations, uh, six combinations are possible. So students get a degree from each university where they study and a diploma supplement. The consortium has three core partners. We are the coordinators. I'm the coordinator of this program. And we have University of Malaga and New Bulgarian University. But I would like to tell you something which is, we, we, which we have been keeping as a secret, but I'll tell you now, so even my students don't know it. The University of Ghent will join as a full partner next year, but they'll only join, they, they will only have students in 2021. University of Ghent from Belgium. And we expect also the University of Bologna to join as a full partner in two years time. So they'll be having the first students at not earlier than 2022. So this is the first time I break this news, this information. And this is a list of some of our associated partners. Those of you who work in translation technology, I'm sure they know Trados, Wordfast, Memsource, Transperfect, Star, 
on Babel for working machine translation, Kudu, Televik are big interpreting technology companies. And we have universities like Universidad de Rio Sande de Zul from where my charming host comes from. <laughs> and also the University of Johannesburg, University of Surrey in the UK, University of Ottawa to be confirmed. And we're going to have also the Hong Kong Baptist University joining very soon. We also hope to have a university from the Middle East joining either from Jordan or from Lebanon uh, or from Qatar. This is something that we are looking at. So it is a very distinctive and unique program. It will prepare the translators and interpreters of the future who will be familiar with the latest tools and resources, but it will also develop uh, pre prepare developers of future technologies. On this program, the majority of the students study have studied translation and interpreting or languages or computer science. We have some computer scientists who have studied natural language processing, but I would like to say that many of the students who have graduated from languages and translation and interpreting, they learn to program and some of them are also very good programmers and I would like to congratulate them for their efforts. So we have three study tracks unofficially, translators who have advanced knowledge of the latest tools in translation, interpreters who have advanced knowledge of the latest tools in interpreting, developers of such tools and natural language processing experts in general. This is a distinctive and unique program. We have research emphasis. You're going to work, those who are going to study with the leading scholars in the field, and, they, and you'll be attending top conferences in the field. This is also very important because there'll be networking and learning a lot. And the industrial emphasis is something very important with, in terms of the placements, but also the industrial partners attend the events and they meet the students, they speak to them, talk to them. Unfortunately, due to the coronavirus, most of our placements are being conducted virtual and some of my students are suffering because of this. It's not very easy. I hope life will become back to normal, but we all have to live in a different way at the moment. It's a distinctive and unique program. It's a very multi multi multicultural program. You can interact with fellow students, with lecturers, with practitioners, businesses and organizations from all over the world. You can have placements in all the continents and you can attend international events as well. So for those students, especially from Brazil, we have quite a few students from Brazil. We have about four students from Brazil, I believe. The Brazilians are very good applicants, by the way. Um, the deadline is the 1st of February. So next year, 1st of February, we have 15 bursaries given by the EC, three of which are earmarked for partner countries, but 12 for non-EC countries. So when Brazilian students apply, they'll be applying for the 12 studentships, which are for non-European countries. And the 30th of June is a deadline for those who pay their own fees, self-funded students. So the deadline has passed, but if anyone is interested to apply, we can extend this deadline exceptionally by the 31st of July. So just in case some of you who are listening, attending this conversation from Brazil or from any other place in the world, have rich parents, this is a good opportunity. So this is a value for money because the best invasion investment is education. The tuition fees may look a bit high, uh, actually, it's 9,000 for countries from outside the EC, but still much cheaper than the fee which is paid by for the UK universities. So this is a list of uh, some of our associated partners. You can see very well-known names. And I'm going to finish. I have another. I'm go I have only five minutes to finish. I'll finish so. I'm very glad it will, I'll fit within an hour and then there'll be questions, of course. One important message to you, to all of you who study translation and interpreting, translators are not endangered species. This is something that I'd like to assure you of. So don't worry, you're not endangered species. And thank you very much, but this presentation hasn't finished. Now I have 
a few more slides. Uh, actually, if you don't have if you don't have time to write down my website address, you can Google my name and you'll find me. Uh, finally, I'm going to ask you, oh, okay, this is a summing up, uh, recapping slide saying that we are really delivering the translators and interpreters of the future of tomorrow who are going to deliver and will get the translation and the interpretation correct. But my question now is, very often human translators criticize the computers. They say computers are rubbish. So my question is, are humans good translators? What do you think? Well, are they always good translators? I'll show you just four or five slides and then this presentation will finish. And those are genuine examples of human translations from the local language into English. This is a very nice book. It also costs only three pounds on the Amazon. Uh, this guy, Charlie Crook, is a British author who traveled around the world, and he collected examples of translations from the local language into English. And this is a hotel in Taiwan, which says, translated from Chinese into English, if there's anything we can do to assist and help you, please do not contact us. And this is translated from Greek into English in Athens. Visitors are expected to complain at the office between the hours of nine and 11 daily. And this is translated from Danish into English in a hotel in Copenhagen, take care of burglars. And this is a real example from Rome, Italy, translated from Italian into English. Ladies, leave your clothes here and spend the afternoon having a good time. This is at a laundry in Rome, a real example. Budapest, Hungary, I like this one very much, translating from Hungarian into English at the Budapest Zoo. Please do not give, please do not feed animals. If you have suitable food, give it to the guard on duty. And finally, this is how a menu has been translated from Arabic into English at a restaurant in Port Sudan. So this is how it says in English. I'm sure that you're going to, to find it very entertaining. So this was the end of my presentation. Um, Husani, I would like to thank you very much once again. Now is the time for questions. Husani, can I ask you a question? When, when all this finishes, the presentation and the questions, do you mind mm -hmm. if you and I and our colleagues from uh, Brazil um, just spend a five minutes on on Zoom. I would like to ask how this uh, lecture can be made publicly available on, yes, sure. on YouTube. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ruslan. Thank you so much for this great presentation. I'm sure everyone loved it because I did actually. And yes, we do have some questions and then I will read them uh, for you. Yeah. And actually, I was going to ask a question myself because I was going to ask you if our young translators should be afraid of the machine. But you have already answered this and you said that no. Yeah, I, I think we can uh, do things uh, together and this can be very good for everyone. Okay. And uh, only, I will only ask... Sorry, sorry. No, I, I fully agree. We shouldn't be afraid of the computers. We should, uh -huh. we should, we should, we should use them as our assistants, but we should not trust them blindly. Let's mm -hmm. treat them with caution. Let's regard them as our assistants, but let's not be afraid of them that they'll replace us because at the moment they cannot replace us. By the way, mm -hmm. I'm very often invited to give a presentation in many different countries. They're asking me to predict the future in terms of natural language processing. They're asking me, what will happen in 200 years? What will happen in 200 years? Uh, what will machines be so intelligent that they'll replace humans? And I, I'm not a clairvoyant, but I, this is a different presentation, so I'm not going to talk about it, but I predict what is going to happen in 2200. By the way, um, well, just to reassure everybody, computers will be getting better and better, but they won't become as good as uh, humans, not in our lifetime. 
So you seen, I just wanted to say a few words about you. Thank you very much. You, I mean, they saw from the presentation that you're not only very friendly, kind and charming, but they also saw that your university is one of our associated partners of this EMTTI program. So those students who are listening, they are from cohort one and cohort two of our program. Now they know you visually, maybe they will decide to go next year on a placement to, to Brazil. I hope, I hope next so. next year it will be possible. There will be no coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Oh, I hope they can come. They will be very welcome. <laughs> okay, very good. So can I read some questions and then maybe you Definitely, can answer sure. them? And there are some comments as well. So uh, let me see do here. We, mm -hmm. Do we know who answered the questions or they're anonymous? Other questions? Uh, no, no, they are not anonymous. Valkyria Teixeira asks you if it is possible to make a postdoctorate course through this program of yours. Uh, is she asking to do a postdoctoral research mm -hmm. or is she asking for funding? Well, actually, uh, I don't know if Valkyria can give us uh, some more details, but the question is just, is it, po is it possible to make a postdoctorate course? It is possible. I think she it was uh, talking about this, uh, this matter. It is possible degree. at the moment. We're a bit difficult with the funding because, because of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. They have uh, frozen our funding. But uh, I suggest that uh, if she's interested, could she please give her my email address and she could write to me and mm -hmm. discuss it. Sure, thank so you. So technically, technically and theoretically it's possible, but we need to discuss the details. Okay, great. Leonardo Pedroso asks you if you believe that MT with AI embedded and all the developments that are being made on the CAD tools will completely replace professional human translators in the future. Well. No, I don't think so. I think it will make the, I think I, mentioned that human translations will not be replaced, much of their job profile may be changed. So they'll be using more and more cut tools or machine translation, and they may act as post editors very often, more than translators, but they'll keep their jobs. It's simply their way of work will change a bit. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, Elisa Teixeira, a, a friend of mine actually, She's a Brazilian as well. She's asking you if there are any postdoctorate opportunities or projects we could join as collaborators. I hope so because I, I, I need yes, to do this. Yes, we can do so. And don't forget that we have this, we have also opportunities to collaborate with you on two fronts. If Britain doesn't have the, the hardest possible Brexit, if Brexit is somehow not so hard, and if Britain Britain stays in the Erasmus Plus um, actually scheme where we could have student, student exchange. If you remember, we have Erasmus Plus collaboration with you, or we wanted mm -hmm. to do at least one. This will give the chance for you and your colleagues to visit us and to work with us, but also to some of your students. They'll receive some funding from this mm -hmm. scheme. So this depends on what negotiations Britain will have with the EC. I'm talking about um, um, countries like Brazil, which could join the so-called called Erasmus Plus scheme. As for, um, we have also opportunity to collaborate a little bit within the EMTTI. Mm -hmm. The funds mm -hmm. are restricted, but we still have some funding there. Great, thank you. Elisa uh, it has also uh, said that uh, one of her mentees is going to participate in this program. Yeah, Ana Beatriz Furtado, and she's very excited for her, and I'm sure she's going to have a great time there. What is her name? Uh, Ana Beatriz Furtado. Yes, I know her. I met her. You I did? had a meeting with, 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 with the new students. So I'll have another meeting with her. So congratulations to, to your colleague and to her. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of people are asking for your email and the link to the program, the site to the, this master's program. You can either share with them right now or I can do this myself afterwards. 
Well, it's up I can. To you. Um, do you want to share this? Um, I can send. Mm -hmm. um, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to find the website address and I'm going to share it with you as a message. Mm -hmm. So. I'll share my screen and then I'll send. Do you see this website? Mm -hmm. so, this, okay. this, so this so this is the this is the website address. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. If, and if, if they can't copy it, uh, they can just send me an email and I will uh, they can send an email to the, the abrupt email. It's there in the registration. And then I can um, copy this link. Sure. Okay, no and problem. If, if they need more information, uh, they're free to email me. I mean, I receive about 2,000 emails a day, but I promise I'll <laughs> reply within two or three days. I promise. Okay, no problem. Marcus Pessanha asked you, do you realize that the major shortcomings of machine translation is that text is processed at sentence level, which prevents rhetorical transposition to make the translated text natural status? Yes, in most cases, this is correct, but not in all cases. Um, I mean, I have worked on an alpha resolution myself, and I've published a book on this, and I have also participated in projects which resolve an aphora across sentences. So there's some machine translation systems which resolve an aphora and they process this course. So they look at two, three, four, five sentences. But those systems are not commercial, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So Marcus is right to a certain, well, to a large extent in that the commercial systems don't, don't do this. But this has to be done and we have already done it at, at an exper experimental level, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, a lot of people uh, are saying that they loved the examples you gave and they are very excited about this uh, master's program. So yeah, I think it's really, really interesting. Now, another uh, question. Uh, Emre, Emre is Turkish and he's a very good friend of mine. So I'm so happy he's here. Uh, he said, Professor Mitkov told that computers won't take the translator's job, but what does he, what do you think about why translators believe this idea? So why do translators believe machine will take our, our job? Well, this is typical human psychology. Every, every, everybody's worried about their job. I mean, I mean, if I were translator, translator, I would be probably worried as well. We don't want to lose our job. Nobody wants to lose our job. So, but I'm talking as somebody who is an objective observer and I can see what's happening. So translators don't lose their jobs. They simply become post editors if needed. This, this is what has been happening. So please mm -hmm. do not, don't be afraid. I mean, what one thing that they could do, what might happen in fact is, I mean, first of all, literary, literary translators will not lose their jobs because translate tra uh, computers are not up to translating literary text yet. So we're mm -hmm. talking about translators of technical, legal, medical texts. Okay, this is true that using translation memory, you can do it faster. This is true that using machine translation, in fact, machine translation can do it sometimes very well. But then machine translation will not be, will not be perfect. So you have to post edit, you have to improve the output. So you still have to do something to do. Or it could be that you're involved paid by a company which develops machine translation. Like I mentioned a company, a very successful company in Lisbon, Portugal, it's called Unbabel. They're one of our associated partners. They are doing fantastic work on neural machine translation. So, okay, you're a translator. You may have, you may not, at some point you may not be translating, but you'll be working for this company developing better machine translation software. So there are all kinds of opportunities. So interpreters, mm -hmm. translators, please don't, don't, don't panic, don't despair. You won't lose your jobs. Stay with us, yeah? <laughs> okay, Alexei Kurilenko, I guess, uh, asks, uh, does 
uh, NLP, Natural Language Processing, has any association with corpus linguistics? Yes, definitely. Um, natural language processing operates on corpora. I mean, all the approaches which are developed, they use corpora for training, for evaluation. Also, deep learning and machine learning, they use corpora to train and to evaluate, so definitely. And in fact, the recent dramatic advances of natural language processing happened after 91, 92, when more and more corpora emerged, because corpus linguistics historically has been an has been known since the 60s, but it wasn't that known that. I mean, we had Chomsky who was not a corpus linguist and he was against corpus linguistics. Yeah. And then it was thanks to his influence, corpus linguistics somehow didn't develop as fast as it should. But if you ask leading corpus linguists, they will tell you that not Chomsky is somebody very out of date and they won't agree with him. So basically what I'm saying is that the real advances in corpus linguistics, the corpora started moving after the early 90s. And this is how natural language processing started moving fast as well. So they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank but, you. But, but there is one difference. There uh. are researchers who use corpus linguistics, like corpus-based translation, corpus analysis, without using NLP. And there are researchers who you use do corpus linguistics analysis using NLP, and those who use NLP are in a privileged position. So I would advise all of you who work in the field of corpus linguistics to consider using natural language processing tools to assist your studies and research. This is my advice. Okay, thank you very much. I need to do this myself. And when I come to visitors, we'll, we'll help you, no problem. Oh yes, and I will, for sure. Well, one more time, Rosalind, thank you so much. And I would like to thank the audience as well. We had all, uh, over 170 participants. So that was really, really good. It is our first live. And it was really a pleasure to have you open this series of lectures for us. And I would like to tell the audience that... Um, we are going to have other lives and our next one will be next week, this Wednesday at the same time, 2 p.m. with Christina Schaffner, yeah? uh, who will talk about metaphor in translation, problems and solutions. And I would like to thank uh, my university as well, the post-graduation program in CAPIS, that's a program here for funding uh, researchers and uh, CAPIS supported us and helped us promote this series of lives. So thank you all. Thank you very much, Rosalind. I and couldn't I be more you, grateful. Rosane, and I would like to thank also Vincent who facilitated, maybe the students didn't see him, who facilitated the broadcasting on YouTube. And yeah, once again, definitely. all the Brazilian international students who attended this talk, I'd like to thank them for their time and interest. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'll stay with you on Zoom now, right? Great. Okay. okay. Hosanna, once, once the life... Um, broadcasting is over, I'll tell you something very interesting probably that you don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe I have told you this, but, but maybe I haven't. What? Tell me. Shall I tell you now? <laughs> yeah, sure. Is everybody listening? Well, I, 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 I don't so. mind. Them, it doesn't matter if they listen, but when I was a student mm -hmm. many years ago, and after that, I was invited by because this reminds me of those years. I was invited by a very famous radio DJ when I was living in Bulgaria. And for about, for about one year, I mean, after I finished my studies, I simply started working maybe after nine months, but I was doing radio, musical radio shows, and I was a, a very successful radio DJ, by the way. So basically speaking now with, with those headphones and with the microphone reminds me of those years when I enjoyed mm. doing radio DJ shows, you know, it was really fantastic. 
but I haven't told you this. You don't know this about me, do you? <laughs> Oh my God, yeah, that, that's great. Yeah, I think we are going back to the old times. Yeah, this is this mm. is interesting, but mm. sometimes technology. <laughs> By the way, uh, I'm sorry that you had to suffer so much with a test. It was not very easy. It was the first uh, broadcasting and you, especially you, probably Vincent as well, but I could see you really stressed out and suffering and <laughs> yeah. i'd like to um, to thank you for not losing your patience and temper it was very difficult you know <laughs> yeah well it's it's never very easy yeah but uh <coughs> just a minute uh well he asked me to to stop broadcasting but uh I tried. I don't. I think you are the host now, so maybe. My, so the, what do you want me to do? To pass the. You you just press the live on YouTube, and then stop transmission. Is it okay? Stop live stream, right? Yeah, that's.